Thank you, Greg. Greg does such an amazing job putting these meetings together and finding just the best people to come and speak to you. Uh, raise your hand if you came last year to the meeting. So maybe about half, a little more than half. Um, so I'll just introduce myself. I'll introduce myself for people who um, aren't familiar with me. My name is Jenny Alstrom. I was diagnosed, oh, first of all, thank you to our sponsors. Amgen and Takeda are here and have tables outside, but we'd like to thank Amgen, Takeda, and Celgene for helping us put on these programs. And without them, we wouldn't be able to do it. So we're just very grateful. And they have tables outside, so please take a stop by um, during the breaks and during lunch and learn what you can from what they have to offer. I was diagnosed at the age of 43. We have six kids, so when I was diagnosed, my kids were between three and 15, and they've grown up <laughs> quite a bit. So I've been super fortunate to be in a remission for a long period of time. And what it's allowed me to do is do advocacy work to give back. And I'm just really thrilled to be doing that. When I was diagnosed, I first went to a general oncology center, and without a bone marrow biopsy, he said, I think you have myeloma, and we'll start you on Velcade on Friday, and don't worry, you won't lose your hair, and then if that doesn't work out, we'll give you a stem cell transplant. And for many of us, we know that that's really suboptimal care, and he said, don't go up to Huntsman because they'll have you doing tandem transplants. And this was back in 2010, and I had a high-risk feature, and I had watched my brother-in-law pass away from AML, and he waited too long for transplant, so we just decided to be hyper-aggressive with it, and I did that. We were, our family was living in Mexico at the time, so we had to decide what do we do with the kids and where are we going to live, and we ended up, um, I, I didn't want to be immuno, I was immunocompromised, you know, for a long period of time with the transplants, with lots of little kids coming home, so I ended up having my transplants done at Huntsman in Utah, in Salt Lake, and my family, and we had like a sister-in-law move down and all the kids were taken care of. And to replace me, my husband jokes and says, you know, it's, it's easy to replace a mom. <laughs> I had a driver, I had a, someone, I have two maids, <laughs> and in Mexico that's kind of common. So I had a gardener, I had a driver, I had five people replace my wife. And it was true, that's what had to happen during that time period. Uh, I did all my maintenance therapy at MD Anderson, and I really understand the value of having a myeloma specialist on your team. You are so fortunate to be in this area uh, with the Mayo Clinic here. It's unbelievable. And I was just talk talking to Dr. Bergsegel, like, I want to get treated here. It's such a peaceful feeling. It's amazing. So you're, you're so lucky because you have some of the best and the brightest who are really leading the field. Um, so I hope you know that and are grateful for it and take advantage of all the skill and talent that they provide. My first question after I finished my treatment was, what can patients do to help accelerate a cure for myeloma? How can we help the researchers? What help can we provide? Because we're really key stakeholders in this whole experience. Uh, and we all need to work together. The pharmaceutical companies are trying to work on drugs that help us. The doctors are trying to help identify better strategies for us. Um, but we need to be active participants in our care. And I really firmly believe that. So I realized that only 3 to 5% of myeloma patients were joining clinical trials. It's very common across adult cancers. And I said, well, why is this so hard? So I got on clinicaltrials.gov and of course, there are you know, 1,400 studies and 450 open studies, and realized that joining a clinical trial in myeloma was really confusing and not very easy. So I started the Myeloma Crowd radio program, interviewing doctors like Dr. Fonseca and Dr. Bergsegel to say, what studies are you running? Why are these important? Explain it to me in language that I can understand. Now, I think I've done about 117, maybe a little more shows on those programs, and it gives us a chance as patients to hear from these amazing experts in an hour-long format, and those shows can be found on our, our website. The Myeloma Crowd website has news and information, life with myeloma stories, events and things like that, that really help, hopefully, explain things in language that we can understand. So we try to take scientific papers and announcements or pharmaceutical announcements or you know early FDA approval and kind of package them so you know 
what's happening in the world of myeloma, and you can kind of stay up to date. We have the roundtables, which you're here at today. We have uh, meetups. We realized that the African American community is twice, to, two to three times as likely to get myeloma, and yet uh, the participation rates in clinical trials and even at meetings is very low. So what can we do to, to help with that? And so we created a myeloma meetups program, and Greg is running those meetings, and we have several per year to invite just that community to help learn more about myeloma. Uh, we also will be providing for patients who live in areas that don't have large support groups. Uh, we'll also be providing um, like 30-minute content with 12 different topics. If somebody wanted to run a support group, support group at with three or four people, and those are the meetups. Um, Greg mentioned the Myeloma Crowd Research Initiative. The first time we did this, um, Dr. Fonseca is on, a, on our scientific advisory board, and we have others from Memorial Sloan Kettering and from MD Anderson and Dana Farber and Mass General and places like that. Just some of the top experts, and we asked them one year what at our we have this annual dinner. We we said what should we be funding if we were going to fund for research? And they unanimously said high-risk research for myeloma because very little was being done. So we did the first ever crowd-sourced and crowd-funded uh, campaign. We did a call for proposals. We got 36 proposals. Um, the advisory board helped us narrow that down to 10. And then we picked two. And these were the two that were our original. We raised half a million dollars for those two. And one was a CAR-T project out of Germany, targeting BCMA and CS1, two targets instead of one. And the other was um, Johns Hopkins and an immunotherapy called MILS. Uh, we've now, Greg mentioned, we've now, um, we did another call for proposals, and this time we wanted to have something that helps integrate with uh, this tool that I'm going to show you today. We wanted to help because some of the doctors are saying, you know, there might be a small percentage of patients that are being cured with this disease, but we don't know who they are and why, and what is it about them? Could it be their, the status of their, their immune system? Um, Dr. Bergsegel does a lot of research on the genetics of myeloma, deep genetics. Is it the genetics of the disease, and the clones are just evolving, and is it that? Um, how do we bring the right treatment to the right patient at the right time? And how can we, as myeloma patients, help encourage that and help them get to conclusions faster? So we have been, uh, we've just selected three projects, and just watch for that on Myeloma Crowd. I haven't had a chance to write it all up yet. <laughs> but if you watch that and subscribe to our newsletter, you'll be seeing the projects that we selected for that. And we encourage you to help support it and share it with your friends and family. I don't know why that looks like it's in a foreign language. <laughs> it wasn't on my slide. Um, we created a product called Health Tree. Uh, at the second annual dinner, uh, we asked the advisory board again, what should we be doing that's not being done? There are lots of great organizations that already exist. We don't want to replicate the good that's already being done. And so what should we be working on? And Dr. Fonseca said, you know, a lot of new drugs have just been approved. Wouldn't it be nice? And, and we noticed that 80% of us are being treated in a community oncology setting, which may not, um, like my experience, may not have the expertise necessary for um, knowing how to treat myeloma in a really nuanced way. How do we bring that type of expertise to all myeloma patients? and close that gap in disparities of care. And so he said, what if you had a tool that could really help identify what patients could consider for treatment options? And wouldn't that help drive things? Now, five years prior to my diagnosis, my brother-in-law that I mentioned had died of AML. He was 33, he had six kids, they were all under 10, and it was the most horrific experience of our family's life, I think. We learned what not to do. We weren't very proactive during that time because it was this year window, so it was just traumatic. So in myeloma, we have more time, um, which is a, a blessing. And um, in his experience, you know, six months into his experience, he was in the ICU kind of hanging on for dear life, looking at a picture of his family, and the doctor kept saying, 
you know, you should really just let him go. I, you're being really mean to keep him alive. And um, my husband had done some research that found that he had a CD33 protein on the surface of his AML cells. And he said, can you try this drug called Mylotarg, which I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was the first antibody drug conjugate ever developed. And you'll, you're going to see a lot of new things coming out in myeloma that are that class of drug. And we said, can you give this to him? Because it had been, been approved for older patients, but not younger patients. And they said, no, sorry, you have to talk to the inventor of the drug, Irv Bernstein. So my husband's a type A person, <laughs> and so am I. And he tracked the doctor down at a restaurant in Seattle that night. <laughs> and he put him on the phone with the head of oncology at Huntsman and said, could you give my brother this drug? And he said, yes, it should be fine. So they administered it to David, and 20, 48 hours later, he was out of the ICU. 72 hours later, he was riding a stationary bike. And he lived another six months, which for him was an important six months with kids that little. We realized that David's story was lost to the other patients that looked like him. And nine years later, nine years, it was FDA approved for that particular indication. It was approved for younger patients with AML, with the CD33 protein, and some other um, specific genetic component. But what if... David had shared that experience with other AML patients. Um, in our meetings that we've, we took a 50-city tour for HealthTree this summer, and we didn't make it to Phoenix, but um, we're here today. <laughs> and maybe we'll do it this summer. I, we, my husband kind of ditched his job. He's a venture capitalist, and his partners were saying, where are you all summer? Um, and my, we, we have um, four of our boys came with us. And we went around city to city, meeting with over 800 myeloma patients to introduce this tool, to get, their to get people's feedback, to learn more uh, about how we could make it better. And um, we just had an opportunity to meet so many amazing people. And the importance of sharing the story was really critical. At the beginning of the meeting, we would say, turn to the person next to you and share your story for one minute and then switch places and the other person share their story. And we couldn't get people to stop talking. <laughs> it was kind of a mean exercise. Uh, but we realized the power of sharing our stories and sharing our data can help researchers come to conclusions faster. So there are benefits in health treat patients um, using it, and there are also benefits to research. So this is kind of a little bit. We, we, my husband's an entrepreneur also, and so he wrote a book called Nail It, Then Scale It. So we took it through really the entrepreneurship process to make sure because a lot of startups fail, so we didn't want to do it wrong. And we tried actually not to do this. We reached out to a lot of tech companies and said, can't you do this? You know, how about um, IBM Watson? You've, you know, you can beat Jeopardy, <laughs> but can't you help cure cancer? And they said, well, give us the patient data and we'll do it. And we're like, well, we don't have the patient data. Uh, we went to, we worked with um, OSU a little bit with Craig Hoffmeister, who had created a registry for myeloma patients. And he built this beautiful registry, um, shared it with all the doctors in Ohio. Wouldn't it be great if all the myeloma patients in Ohio could do this? And then the other doctors in the oncology settings wouldn't share it with their patients. And he said, why aren't you sharing it? And he said, well, you didn't include me in the study design, and I'm kind of nervous that you would steal my patient. I'm like, okay, well, that's not going to work. Um, the pharmaceutical companies do great work, but they're restricted from interacting with patients. And we just realized we are going to have to do this. The patients are going to have to drive a system like this. They're going to have to be willing to share their experience with others and learn from others' experience. So we built it. Um, we did a, an alpha product in the spring. We took it to four support group meetings or health tree meetings. And then we took it on the road in a beta this summer. And um, now we have 2,100 patients participating in health tree. So we're thrilled. Um, and you'll be able to see a little bit more. I'm not going to show you those because I'm going to actually do a demo. Is the yes. Uh -huh. It's only myeloma right now, but I could see how I think our next disease would probably be AML because some myeloma patients can acquire AML. 
Um, and then we can, I think once it works for myeloma and we do it right in myeloma, we realized that it had to be, it was all surrounding um, the issue of trust. And the most important questions we get when we do our meetings, our health treat meetings across the country were, who are you? Why are you doing this? And what are you gonna do with my data? <laughs> and all valid, important questions. So we did it inside of a nonprofit on purpose because we didn't wanna think about how do we monetize the data? And we didn't wanna have dollar signs be over anybody's head. All we care about is a cure. And it will be a happy day when um, I'm not working on my Loma anymore. <laughs> we realized going across the country that we, um, that a lot of people just needed help. So we're building this myeloma coach program. We're a couple weeks away from announcing it. But if you want to give back and help another patient with myeloma, um, we'll put you through different training that it, like on health tree and things like that. And if you're willing to volunteer eight hours or more a month and make a one year commitment, you can become a myeloma coach. Uh, thank you for coming today. It's really amazing that you're here. Uh, I'm going to give a little demo for Helltree before, and a quick demo so you can just see the tool. But you're here today because your knowledge is going to impact your outcomes. And I hope you know that because what you do um, in your own advocacy is just incredibly helpful. Okay, let me... So I'll just give you a quick overview of Health Tree, and then um, we will move along. If you want to understand our story a little bit about our family, you can watch this video here. Um, sometimes patients, this has been an educational tool for patients to say, do I really understand my disease? Do I know what kind of myeloma I have? Uh, if you need help with that, there's a questionnaire right here that you can download. If you click on that, it shows you a PDF. You can bring it to your facility and you can say, you know, I, remind me, what treatments did I have when? And what kind of genetic features do I have? Help me understand my fish test. You don't have to, you can ask the nurse or your PA these types of questions. You don't have to have an appointment with your doctor to do it. And they're happy to help you. So that's just something. So there are three benefits. Number one, you can identify treatment options that might be available to you at your particular stage of disease based on the specific features, and I'll show you that. We've integrated with Spark Cures, like Greg mentioned, and Spark Cures is a clinical trial finder tool that is amazing. So if you've never taken a look at that, please do. But it's built into HealthTree, so you, you can have a separate Spark Cures account, but if you create a HealthTree account, you also create a, automatically create a Spark Cures account. And then what we talked about before, you can share your myeloma story to advance a cure. Okay, so I will sign in here. We invite you to share information about yourself, and based on your zip code, it'll show you myeloma academic centers that are near you. We also are building out a specialist directory so that you can see it by geography and region. And for people who have never thought about, I'm getting a lot of calls now um, for people who are just diagnosed or, or whatnot, and they're going through the same experience that I did. And it's so critical that you have a myeloma specialist on your team to consult with that this is a key, a key thing. We ask about um, anybody helping you with your care for emergency contact purposes, and then you sign a consent basically to participate. We ask you to fill out your diagnoses. So let's say you started out with MGUS and you progressed to smoldering myeloma and then you progressed to active myeloma. You would enter multiple diagnoses on different dates. And that's important. I was just talking to Dr. Morgan last night about he wants to see how long did it take somebody to progress from smoldering myeloma to active myeloma. And that's something we can show. You include your myeloma physicians that are treating you. We ask about health conditions that would impact the treatments that you got. For example, if you already have really severe neuropathy, you might not see a Velcade in your list. Or if you have ongoing heart failure, you might not see a carfilzomib in your list. So it helps customize the list for you. And these aren't all your health conditions, it's just basically um, things that are related to your myeloma care. 
We ask about fitness status because fitness in myeloma really matters. You can kind of go down these questions. Uh, your fitness status matters. If you're fit and older, you can get a transplant. If you're unfit or frail, um, that's a little harder. So we ask those questions. The myeloma genetics is where you might need the most help um, understanding that. But you can, under, you can either upload a fish test result or some kind of a test result and have us help you look at it. Or you can um, enter it in from the information that your nurse or doctor gave you, or you you might. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, and uh, turn off the <laughs> That's my son, actually. <laughs> um, and if you had high risk lab values at diagnosis, that does impact. We ask about prior therapies that you received. So here's the list of mine. I got DPACE which was my induction therapy for my transplant. I got a transplant, and six weeks later, I got another transplant. Um, then I did a year of maintenance therapy with a triplet, and then I did another year of DEX, which I don't think I'd do again, because my friend says that's the drug that makes everyone else stupid. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> and so I can include my bone strengtheners, my antifungals. Um, I can include uh, radiation in these treatments. I can include a clinical trial that I participated in. And when you go through the workflow, it'll kind of take you through the workflow, what kind of treatment you got. And we're asking people to do it in blocks. We connect with each patient to verify this order and the combination um, because we want the data to be extremely valid when we're trying to run reports on it. So we also have um, a way to track your labs. So because some patients are seen at facilities that are, um, don't have a portal at all, and they just get a printout, they can add their labs manually. But there's, it's open for error, right? So the more that automated entry that we can have, the better. These are the myeloma markers, basically, that we're looking at. You can also say, get my labs, and you can sign a consent form for your portal, and we'll go get your first and last labs. So. It, the labs are important because if you want to see a list of clinical trials you're eligible to join at that moment in time, you need to add your last set of labs because all the trials are, the eligibility criteria is based on those. Something cool that we are working on right now is an, an, a phone app to help you um, upload the information automatically from your portal. And I know that you're changing over portals here at the Mayo Clinic, but like I have a MyChart system, which is an Epic system, which is similar to what you're getting right now. And I can connect um, all my labs through the phone up into my health tree profile. So we just recently did that and it grabbed all my labs automatically for me. So don't spend a lot of time entering manual labs, please just do your first and your last. And then hopefully when you're, you know, you're, portal gets on that list. We've done an integration with Apple Health, so if you have an iPhone, you'll be able to do that. We ask other questions that are full health profile type questions, and once you answer those questions, they go into this summary tab. So for example, how many patients in HealthTree are, are African American? Um, how many patients are smoldering myeloma or MGUS patients? Um, what type of uh, prior family history of cancers? did myeloma patients have? Those are all things that we as patients can answer really quickly for people and for the researchers. So those are the types of questions. What type of myeloma do we have? There are also surveys that you can answer for myeloma experts. So this will be a give to get system and myeloma experts will be able to access the anonymous data for free. Um, we don't, we want them, the goal is cure, remember? <laughs> So the faster we can get them to conclusions, the better. And s simple things, we don't want investigators to have to run really formal big studies that are expensive and time consuming when we can answer the questions quickly. So like Dr. Thompson, he wanted to know, were you vaccinated after your stem cell transplant? How about the flu? How about the shingles? Which, which shingles vaccine? Just to get a sense of who's, who's doing what in myeloma and are patients getting the care that they need. So that will be a feature in the researcher portal. They'll be able to ask questions. 
Based on the information that you entered, this is my personalized list. I had answered a question earlier about relapse. I'm having a biochemical relapse, not a clinical relapse. So what could I consider as treatment options? And as you can see, there's a lot of options. There are 21 different three drug combinations. That's a lot, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> kind of mind boggling. Uh, we sent a survey out to 200 myeloma specialists and said, how would you treat in this situation? How would you treat the newly diagnosed patient? Well, that's standard risk. How about the newly diagnosed high-risk patient? How about the patient that's relapsed after Revlimid maintenance? How about the patient who relapsed after proteasome inhibitor maintenance? Um, how about an unfit or frail patient? How would you treat? And they responded back with the survey questions. 25 responded. And we used those to build out this list of expert preferred treatments. That's where that's, that logic is coming from. We'll run that survey every six months to keep it up to date. And as I, I made the rounds when my numbers started going up with my doctors, and they all kind of said the same thing. They would, they would do this, Dara RD. So if you want to learn more about the treatment combination, you click on it, and it shows you more information about the treatment combination, a little history. It shows you kind of usage at a glance, expert videos talking about that treatment combination, and research papers that you can link to to do your homework. So you can go and do your homework at home, um, you, you can add personal notes to it, you can print it out, and you can take it to your doctor and have an intelligent conversation about your next steps. I, I never wanted to feel like I was running out of options, and there are so many options in myeloma that um, it's just important for us to be proactive about our care. This is never, ever a replacement for a medical opinion by an expert because they know more about you than we're gathering in HealthTree. So please um, use your expert. <laughs> Clinical trials, um, we've integrated, like I said, with Spark Cures. And these are the list of clinical trials that I could potentially join. So if you click through, you'll go through the, the Spark Cures list. And they have a concierge service to help you understand how to get into the trials or what you need to do. So use that service. It's truly, truly amazing. The doctors love this page the most, the summary page, because if they're going to give a second opinion, it's really helpful to see everything in two pages, one or one page. So it's got my disease history and my current physicians, my myeloma genetics, uh, my lab values potentially, my last five lab values, and my prior therapies and side effects. And we've had some of the doctors say, gosh, you know, we're not even capturing side effects right now because sometimes we just don't have time in the clinic to talk about it, or sometimes patients just don't tell us because they don't want us to take them off treatment. The My Reports section is in process. Um, we will be running anonymous reporting on this data, so your name will never show up anywhere, or your email you won't, won't be marketed to, and um, your data won't be sold. So those are the, some of the types of reports, and we're just barely starting on working on that. But um, I'm here through lunch, <laughs> so if you have any questions about the platform, uh, I would be happy to answer them, and it's been an amazingly rewarding experience. Like I said, we have 2,100 patients. Our goal is to get to 10,000 patients. And our goal by the end of the year was 1,000 patients. So we've doubled our goal. And I'm just really thrilled that we've had the response with everyone that wants to help accelerate a cure. And with that, I will turn things over to you.